Einen schönen guten Nachmittag, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren, zum 75. Locarno Festival. Wir freuen Sie, hier begrüßen zu dürfen. Und hier sehen Sie das wunderbare Team von My Neighbor Adolf. Thank you, Olivia. <laughs> Uh, well, welcome to everybody to the 75th Locarno Film Festival and to the press conference of the Piazza Grande film, My Neighbor Adolf, directed by Leon Prudowski. It is my pleasure to have up here with me to my left the director, Leon Prudowski. Uh, next to him, the actors, Olivia Serhavi, David Heimann, and Udo Kier. And at the end, the producer, Heim Meckelberg. Uh, please remember that there is translation um, earphones at the back if you need them. Uh, up here front, you have the translation earphones as well. Um, just uh, to start, Leon, um, you didn't just direct the film, but you also co-wrote it with uh, Dimitri Malinsky. Can you maybe just take us back and describe what inspired you to write the script? Uh, yes, um, so well, it's quite simple. We started out as I, I came back like 12 years ago. I came back from uh, Brazil from a film festival, and um, I had a conversation with uh, Dimitri, who is my friend from when we were three years old, and he's my colleague, and we worked together. And I told him about uh, Brazil, and he said, "Let's make a film about Hitler hiding in Brazil, like like the boys from Brazil." And I said, oh, "I don't want to speak about Hitler. I don't know what. To, I don't know how he thought, how he." So, um, but this night I was thinking a lot about it and I was thinking about my grandmother and my grandfather who uh, uh, during the Holocaust they, they got inside the Russia and uh, my, uh, my grandfather, he, became, he, he went to the Red Army and my grandmother, uh, she was sent somewhere um, and I remember how obnoxious she was, irritated person, this, this, this post-trauma, thinking about the war, this, this uh, um, strange thing with Germans that they, they, she had and, and the dogs. And suddenly I said, let's make a film about someone who has this trauma, who's trying to prove himself that he's the, the guy who lives next door is Hitler or maybe not. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. Okay, and since you bring up your, your family history, maybe what kind of additional responsibility did that heritage bring to you? Sorry, once again? Uh, what kind of additional responsibility did you have because of your family heritage? I, I just heard responsibility, like, what? No responsibility? <laughs> Why? Uh, I don't know, it's... Um, I don't feel any responsibility. I feel that I want to tell a story. I feel connected to the story. I feel connected to the story culturally and, and for my family. And I'm telling it, you know, that's, that's kind of it. I mean... Um, I, you might say that uh, being someone from the third generation of Holocaust, I can joke about the Holocaust. Maybe, I don't know, I never thought about it. I guess it's, it's kind of true, but I like jokes about everything. So, um, you know, <laughs> if someone who doesn't know what the Holocaust is and he's joking about it and it's good, it's good, no problem. Well, this brings me to a question to David Hyman because this, um, this theme about the comic comes in because, of course, you, you play a character who has suffered unimaginable trauma, but at the same time, he's also a comic actor. And I, I was wondering, a uh, character, and I was wondering, as an actor, how you encompass both extremes in a performance like this. Uh, I think the secret is you don't play comedy, you don't play drama, you go for the truth of the situation. Udo and I flew to Colombia not to make a comedy. We went to bring alive a beautiful, beautiful, sensitive, funny, and with a dark underbelly script. Uh, and I think Udo and I just played the truth of the situation. If you think about it, it's a situation comedy. That's what it is, with a dark underbelly, with a tragic underbelly. Uh, but neither Udo nor I played that. We played for the truth of the moment, and it seems to work. <laughs> <laughs> it does beautifully. Uh, Udo Kier, you, you're no stranger to playing evil characters. You've played Dracula, <laughs> Dr. Frankenstein. In fact, you, you already played Hitler once, and here you play a character who might or might not be Hitler. Can you tell us how you approach this ambiguity? Well, hello. Uh, first of all, I played Hitler, I guess, 
five or six times, <laughs> but only in comedy. And I was always thinking about Charlie Chaplin, the dictator kicking the world. That was my intention. And for this film, I got the script, and I wanted, I talked to Leon, the director, and I said, I would like to meet you to spend one afternoon together in the desert where I live, in Palm Springs. And he came because I liked the idea very much. And for me, uh, <coughs> playing then when we were talking about that big bear that I had and all that, and for me, it is, I just want to say something. In America, the press today and yesterday, is criticizing that his film is shown here. And I want to say thank you very much for the director of the festival that he said, no, the film is shown here, because it's no racist. It's a tragic comedy. And as David says, we had no intention when we start the movie to doing anything political. Uh, I mean, it was a script, of course, political, but it was like, uh, for us, it was just like I'm the man next to him and he recognized me because you, you know the film, but from where he recognized me, and that's how we, we did it. And, you know, I'm not saying about the ending because why should I? Uh, you have no surprise. And it is a surprise, actually, the ending, but we had a great time. And also, again, one sentence or two for the festival. A festival is there to show whatever they want. They want uh, politically or sexually or whatever. That's why it's a festival. And you see in Locarno things which you wouldn't see in Cannes or in Venice because they're big and commercial and the world is watching it. So I think it's very, very good that the director said the film is going to stay. That's it <laughs> for me. Uh, if there are any questions from the floor, don't hesitate to raise your hand and I'll call on you. We have a mic. Um, Olivia Silhavi, as with uh, Mr. Kier's role, you play a character that on the surface is evil. She even gets described as a Gestapo lawyer, but then it, she turns out to be much more nuanced than that. And there's even the role that she's the only woman who gets to enter this closed man's world. So I was wondering, uh, as with the other actors, how did you approach these various facets of the performance? My approach towards uh, these conflicting aspects of, uh, of the same character. Well, I have to follow somehow David. I didn't have the feeling that it was conflicting for me. It was like I'm his personal assistant. We had a certain past together. And um, it's a loyalty towards uh, Mr. Herzog. And so I will do everything for him. And um, as David described it, you just get into it and you, you feel the role, the character, and then you just um, do it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, hi, Michael Varig. Uh, this is now your third collaboration with Leon Prudovsky after the feature Five Hours from Paris in 2009 and the short Welcome and Our Condolences in 2012. Uh, these films all explore different facets of the Israeli experience, so clearly there must be a strong affinity between you that brings you to work together and to keep uh, continuing this uh, thematic exploration, if you will. I was wondering if you could talk about this. Um... Yeah, well, I fell in love with uh, Leon's work uh, together with Esti, my partner, when we saw his graduation film uh, that was in the same line of everything that he always does, it, his work promotes dialogue. Uh, and for, for us, it was really important that we're trying in all our films to promote values that we believe in. And Leon, in all his films, really talks about the same values. And he does it in such an artistic and beautiful way. He does it in such a beautiful way, and he has the tendency to deal with tough and difficult uh, issues with such a great sense of humor and delicate sense of humor that uh, it's just a pleasure working with him. Oh, there's a question here. 
Yeah, hi, I'm Marlene with Schweizerische Stürte. Um, I uh, was wondering from the two actors, to keep it light a little bit, um, what was the most, let's say, unusual neighbor you ever had, David and Udo? And also if you have any history with the Locarno Film Festival, because it's the 75th anniversary. Uh, when I was a child, from the age of, I, I, the first two years I spent on my grandmother's sofa, uh, the next three years we sp the family spent in one room with one kitchen in a tenement in Glasgow. Our next door neighbor was a little man called Mr. Giaconelli, who wore a black suit and a black hat. He never spoke. We would see him coming up the stairs, opening up his door and going in. About an hour later, we would hear <laughs> This went on for three years. We never knew what the banging was. I came home from school one day, and my mother said, Mr. Giaconelli has died come and see inside his house. The, the door was open. He lived in one room. All the walls and the ceiling were covered in tin cans. He would take a can of soup or a can of beans, wash it out, he would flatten it, put a nail through it, and he built this extraordinary metal protection in his room. That's the most bizarre neighbor <laughs> I have ever... We never got to the secret of why he had to protect himself with tin cans, but this, I wish we had camera phones in those days. I would have taken a photograph of it. And one day, I will put it in a film. <laughs> well, for, uh, for me, it was, of course, in the film that I have a neighbor because my assistant got me that house, and I go there and have a neighbor who is spying on me because of course I felt it, I, you know, from my generation I know. So he was in the window, he was behind the fence all the time. So that was the strange neighbor I had in him. Uh, but then, you know, it, gets, it was melting more and more uh, away that we, you know, talked to each other and suspicious, of course because first uh, he was suspicious, but he was sure that he is right, and I was just trying to find out. So it was a strange neighbor for me. In my private life, I didn't have strange neighbors. <laughs> I lived with my mother alone. I was born at the end of the war, 1944, and there was no time for neighbors. <laughs> I was being happy to have something to eat. So that's why this time also, uh, it was very important for me, so. And your history at the festival? What? Your history at the festival? What? Here, the festival, I, the, uh, uh, the f first time I think I came in 86 or something, I had a, a, a film and then, uh, I uh, went twice in the jury over the years, which was very interesting because you see a lot of interesting films, you know, if you want or not. If you're the jury, you have to talk about it and give your uh, appreciation to it if it's good. So that was my uh, thing. And yesterday I did fly 20 hours or 24 hours being here from <laughs> Palm Springs to LA to Frankfurt to Milano and by the car here. But I'm happy to be here and seeing friends again like we haven't seen for a while. So that's good. And I just hope that the film will be understand in the right way and not getting into political discussion now. That would be horrible. We had a question at the back. <coughs> Intanto complimenti per il film. Perché? Perché è un film che incuriosisce per vari motivi. E il primo è quello dell'epoca in cui il film è situato. È un film eh, situato nel, negli anni 60, Eichmann è stato preso e infatti porta il giornale lì e mh, mi ha incuriosito molto la ricostruzione di questo periodo 
una ricostruzione che secondo me eh, riesce a mettere in evidenza la grande confusione che esisteva in quel tempo riguardo a tutto quello che era successo prima e questa idea molto che viene confermata all'ambasciata is israeliana è bella perché dice continuano a telefonarci di aver visto Hitler vicino eccetera per cui volevo sapere qual è stato il vostro lavoro di eh, ricostruzione eh, temporale attraverso appunto tutte queste eh, questa cura nel, nel dettaglio di un tempo che era così evidentemente For me, I guess, right? Yeah. <coughs> um, I'm uh, trying to think what exactly can I tell you about this because there is nothing very special about, you know, we, we made a very profound uh, uh, research, um, texts, books, um, pictures, movies, whatever we could find to, to have some, um, some anchors to build the, the world of this 60s, but our 60s, right? So what was important is to see what are the anchors of the, of the time, of the period, and what do we need dramatically? And then to try and build one without, uh, with, the, with the other. So it will be truthful and effective in, in, in the emotional and dramatic way. So I think that there would be, uh, that, that would be like the, the, the general answer for that. Um, I don't have any, anything more interesting to tell you. So if there's no more questions, we have time for one more. Only um, one. Uh, unfortunately, I came yes. all the way, only one question. <laughs> you must be joking. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Excuse me. Then uh, I, I will... No, and then I will ask the question to Leon to close. Hello, I'm yes. Marcel Schmidt from way... whatthefilm.ch. Ah. Um, what? Sorry. What? Um, my, my question goes to Udo Kier. How was it for you to pre pre prepare for this role and how exactly did you do that? I just was there, had conversation with David, and we, when you shoot not in your city and your location, you spend much more time together because <coughs> of the hotel and things. And there was not much, we had a director who told us the story from the script. Was, it was very well written, the script, and it was very easy to, we just followed what was uh, written. Preparation, what is preparation? I made a film, uh, Swan Song, which is everywhere now, and I did not act, I tried not to act at all, which is difficult when you do it for 50 years then you always know tricks about coming good in front of the camera. But I didn't prepare myself. I just did what the uh, director and David, what we talked about. There, there is one little thing that I really want to tell because uh, you see us, like five of us, and there are much more people here from the crew, but you have to understand we finished shooting five days before Corona started in the world. So basically, uh, just draft after shooting, we were for two and a half years, uh, for two years, we didn't know what's going to happen with the world, with cinema, with our film. And I think the celebration of the film for us was very special, but I think it's very important for everybody because it shows that life continues <laughs> even after those two years, right? And we are here and we're with the film, so very happy about that. I remember going back and uh, Corona had started already in Europe and I went to the production and I said, we are talking about we need a mask. Do you have a mask for me? And I went to in Medellin to pharmacies and they all had no masks because they didn't sell masks. So they had in the, in the emergency pack for the production, they, they gave me one mask with me. Yeah? So this is how I flew back and then the whole thing started. But to imagine that, yeah, that at that time, uh, no one could imagine that. Okay, well, thank you all so much. And we wish you a wonderful premiere tonight on Piazza Grande. We're done. I'm afraid so. Continue later. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I just want to tell you something before we all go.
that you will see me in December in a film called Hunters with Al Pacino, and I play the real Adolf Hitler. <laughs> What do you mean the real? What do you mean the real? But you, you played the real as well. The, the real. Okay, that's enough. Thank you. Uh, the, to play real is you study the speeches and all that, and you just become more evil. And uh, you know, after playing five times Adolf Hitler in comedy, that's the first film, and I didn't want it to do it. I swear, I didn't want it to do it because for many reasons. But I did it, so let's see how people like. I'm 94 years old, three hours makeup. Uh, Lena Olin is my wife, Eva Brown. We live in Argentina, and we'll be found. And then is the trial, and there's a horrible trial. That's the film about it. Okay. Thank you so much. So, where are we going now? <laughs>